Thank you for the opportunity of presenting some aspects of the Abbey Here project. This is a joint collaboration between the Abbey Here Heritage Trust and the Sacred Landscapes project. My presentation will concentrate on the visual aspects of the work undertaken, predominantly on the landscape archaeology associated with the Cistercian Abbey. The project covers much else. It is very much work in progress that I will be showing you. Let's first take a look at Kumhir's location using this LiDAR visualisation. Kumhir is set here in a river valley amongst steep sided hills. There is a mixture of valley arable lands and forested slopes and sheep walks. Here we see the abbey in the middle distance. In the foreground, a modern road crosses a bridge over the Tluweda brook on its way to the small village of Abicum here. A watermill and a smithy once existed next to the bridge. Of the abbey itself, little now remains, apart from the stunted walls outlining what was once the ambitiously huge nave. In the 1820s, Thomas Wilson acquired the abbey and part of what were once the abbey's land holdings. He set about tidying up the site, removing many tons of rubbish to create a garden. The neat ruins we see today are largely a result of that clearance. Part of that beautification is a lake and a viewing mound, which may once have been topped by a gazebo from which he could sup tea and survey his garden. In early 2019, I was asked by the Abbey Here Heritage Trust to indicate a photogrammetric survey of the Abbey grounds and surrounding areas. Here you see the central area that I covered with my drone. The Abbey ruins and the lake are near the centre of this image. From the photographs taken, it was possible to create a detailed three-dimensional digital model of the visible surface. That model could be manipulated using a variety of software to create a range of visualizations. This image, for example, shows many features never previously recorded. With this new information, new insights and understanding of the Abbey precinct are generated. The digital models are geo-referenced and one can zoom into it or view it from different directions. The underlying photography has a resolution of around one inch per pixel. This image, generated from the same information, uses a different algorithm. In this case, small scale changes in slope are emphasized. Here we have the Abbey walls, the mound, the lake. The Cluadic brook runs through the site. Here are the buildings of the home farm. And very obviously, here are the marks of previous ploughing. This is the boundary bank of the precinct. There's so much more in this image, but let us for a moment just concentrate on a few parts 
this area here, just where the transept should have been, might have been. This curious structure over in this direction, over towards the west, and to take another look at these plough marks. Here we have zoomed into the eastern end of the ruins. The prominent features are the nave and a tree line. But I want to draw your attention to these rectangular features which extend under the tree line. Our current interpretation is that they indicate the outline of a post-dissolution house. The photogrammetric techniques used can detect very subtle variations of surface level, so it is not surprising that no one walking over this area has detected this previously. A geophysical survey commissioned by CPAT recorded some inconclusive anomalies near the end of the nave, but did not cover uh, the ground close to the tree line or into the next field. Following the dissolution in 1536, the abbey passed through a number of hands before being acquired by the Fowler family of Shropshire. A hundred years later, Fowler referred to his poor house at Cumir. This might be the remains of this house. I also want to draw your attention to this bank, and in particular to the southern end. Here, and in other images, it is clear that it overlaps and hence is later than the east-west bank. We now interpret this as a civil war feature, a defensive bank protecting the Fowler House. In 1644, a garrison of some 300 royalist troops were stationed at the Abbey, an important strategic location. They were overcome in a surprise attack by a superior force of parliamentarians in December of that year. Just inside the boundary bank, at the western end of the precinct, is this square feature, partly overlain by a modern house. This is now recognised as being a civil war bastion, defending that royalist garrison from attack from the west. Just west of the farm buildings are the very evident marks of ploughing from different periods. At the top of the image, ploughing crosses some east-west features. The year before we took these photographs, Toby Driver had photographed this area during the drought of 2018. His photograph of the same area showed parch marks of pits which he identified as graves in a graveyard. This was followed up by some excavations by CPAT, which confirmed Toby's hypothesis that the pits revealed by the parch marks were indeed grave cuts. No human remains, such as skeletons, were found, not surprising in this acidic soil. I have commented on only a few of the huge advances that have been made over the last three years, despite COVID, in our understanding of the Abbey. Much of it remains to be fully assimilated, and I confidently expect a lot more revelations as the project proceeds. I want now to move beyond the Abbey itself to look at other work of the project. Again, I would stress that this is work in progress. 
Through the partnership with the Sacred Landscapes Project, we have been introduced to QGIS, and my next few slides are derived using that programme. Outlined in red is the extent of the core Abbey land holdings, as mapped in David Williams's outstanding Atlas of Cistercian Lands in Wales. In the over 300 years of the Abbey's religious existence, its holdings would have changed. We have sought to understand this dynamic change. Although there is a serious lack of documentary evidence over this entire period, we are lucky that an original charter, or at least confirmation, of land granted by Roger Mortimer exists. This charter of 1200 details the boundary of the grant. That boundary can, for the most part, still be identified. I have outlined in blue my reading of the charter. I am least certain of the details of the extension towards St. Harmon, that it did extend eastwards and only covered the lower part of the area identified by Williams, I am certain. Looking at some of the charters by Welsh princes in the years following the 1200 charter begins to fill out the picture. The blue circles are places, farms, which we can identify. Farms with names similar to those referred to in the 13th century charters still exist. The other circles represent farms which we have traced from the dissolution as Abbey lands using later sources. The apparent separation of a northern group from a southern group is illusory as the gap is mainly upland sheep walks belonging to the adjacent farms. We still have a lot of research to do in this work. I now want to move on to looking at one of the farms, a single farm, that has been focus of a lot of our work. The farm is situated just in this little corner. The present farm, Conform, consists of the amalgamation of four earlier farmsteads. This photograph shows the lower part of the farm. Abbeycombe here is a mile or so away around the corner visible in the top left. This land, a mixture of arable fields and sheep walks, is part of the lands identified in the 1200 charter and so has been farmed constantly since at least that time and probably much longer. We discovered a previously unrecorded Bronze Age cairn on the site. The entire farm of some 350 acres has been photogrammetrically surveyed with a resolution of around one inch per pixel, as well as showing earlier field systems. This has revealed a number of other previously unrecorded features. Here we can see one of those features. This is on the sheep walk near the northernmost part of the farm. Clearly visible is an enclosure with earth banks on three sides. A platform joins it while a spring below provides water. This is more obvious in this image, in which the 3D digital model has been tipped slightly. The enclosure would probably have been closed by removable hurdles. The enclosure, presumably for sheep, may have been used in flock management or for milking. Alternatively, it could have been for security from predators such as wolves or from other humans.
Another feature near that enclosure is shown here amongst fields, most of which are now covered in boggy vegetation. A small stream flows past this enclosure. A closer view shows the remains of a small dwelling nestling next to the stream. Partly eroded by the stream and obscured by vegetation is what may have been an unrecorded shepherd's dwelling. Still in the northern part of the farm, next to the bank which separates the enclosed, obscured field system, is a puzzling circular earthwork. Its purpose and date is still largely a matter of speculation. The line of the boundary bank seems to move slightly to avoid it, though this could be accidental. This was first noticed by the farmer, Ian Lewis, when he was cutting back the covering vegetation a year or so ago. It appears to be too fresh to be prehistoric, and it's not at all clear which came first, the bank or the circular earthwork. I mentioned previously that there were once four earlier farmsteads on the present farm. This is a photogrammetric view of one of them, Lanek Dirion. Here, alongside the present farm track, is the remains of that farm. Prominent in this image are two small enclosures of unknown purpose. Just to the north is a boggy area covered in coarse vegetation with some humps and bumps. There, Ian and his wife Angela noticed some evidence of cobbling. Under the professional watchful eye of Gemma Besant of the Sacred Landscapes Project, a group of enthusiastic volunteers set to excavating the site and learning excavation processes. This is Gemma, and this is Angela. Here we are at rest, showing off the tools of the trade, ranging rods, wheelbarrow, grid, fine table, comfy chairs, and of course a toilet. This again is a work in progress. The group will reconvene again when COVID and weather allow. These photos were taken before the final cleanup of the exposed cobble surfaces. What was revealed in this first season is the floor of a stables. Here you can see the base of partitions there and there, dividing the stables up into three stalls, smaller ones on each side and a larger one in the middle. Also visible are the post holes there and there. While the interpretation of the stables as a wooden building with a cobbled floor is clear. The function of this other area excavated is less clear. Any final conclusion here will require excavation of adjoining areas. Something to look forward to in season two. Like other Cistercian monasteries, Cumhia had a number of granges. In addition to the core holdings, I have located those mapped by Williams 
in his atlas in purple. We see part of our work as elucidating the true extent of these granges and as much as we can of their history. This task has only just begun. We are currently signing up local volunteers to help in this work. As you can see, the granges were spread widely. When I was first volunteered to join the project, I had in mind a 10-year project. I now think that that was optimistic. I want first to look at this grange, Dalhelfa. The area in red on this map is the extent of the Grange plotted by Williams. It consists mainly of arable land alongside the River Wye. It is where there is a current farm named Dolhelfa, another instance of farm continuity in this area. This Grange is described in Roger Mortimer's 1200 Charter, and it is easy, in this case, to map the donation with little ambiguity. The blue area marks my reading of the Charter. It should come as no surprise that this area includes upland sheep walks. So far, I have only surveyed the eastern edge of the Grange with my, gro with my drone. This area here. The charter describes the Grange boundary in terms of a small stream. It comes up the valley here before going over to a much larger river, which is in this gully here, this major uh, ravine almost. The bank you can see very clearly here. In white is a modern farm track. But now I'm crossing across here, down here, and going downhill to the river. Just to make the point, the gully stroke ravine is a spectacular feature in this area. Photogrammetric view maps part of the eastern boundary. The still substantial boundary leaves the small stream, crosses the sheep walk, and then descends down the gully to the river below. In doing so, it crosses a smaller tributary gully. What struck me forcibly was the signs of these small enclosures, most probably medieval, possibly contemporary with the Grange Bank and hence with the Cistercian Grange. Here is that tributary gully leading down to the main river and the fields associated with it. The boundary bank of the Grange is clearly seen crossing this area. Viewed from a different angle, it is possible to see a small platform just here, on which there was presumably a small building. Just below, there is a spring. This alternative photogrammetric view shows the boundary bank, the small enclosures with their platform, and the source of water. In many ways, this description is similar to that of the enclosure on the northern sheep walk at Cunforn.
Just across the ravine from those enclosures is another set of interesting earthworks. This elongated rectangle was originally identified as a chapel and marked as such on the earlier OS maps. Current OS maps mark it simply as a platform. The current view is that it is a sheep cot. Sheep cots were one of the innovations in sheep farming introduced by the Cistercians. There is also in this image some other features, partly obscured by vegetation. A photogrammetric view reveals the form of the sheep cot more clearly. In this view, it is possible to see where there were four entrances into its western side. There are also hints at another rectangular feature beneath the obscuring vegetation, just here. Whether this was another sheep cot or other building forms is not possible yet to determine. This view also shows a small three-sided rectangular enclosure. The accuracy of its right-angled corners suggests a relatively modern date, perhaps associated with field sports. For comparison, this is a sheep cot near Strata, Florida, that I surveyed last year. The similarity is evident. This one is situated around a mile north of Strata, Florida, and like the one near Dolhelfa, is situated on the edge of upland sheep walks. Close to the Dolhelfa sheep cot, is this interesting farmstead on the open sheep walk. The farmhouse itself is under the tree cover, marked in orange at the centre. I like the pattern of the earlier curvilinear fields, contrasting with the later rectilinear pattern. I have not yet walked this farmstead, so I must mark this down again as work in progress. Moving now to another site that has excited me. This one is on the edge of the Kempton Terrace Sheep Walk, an extensive area of upland. This image shows, in the foreground, an incursion into the Sheep Walk, known as Groys, a Welsh word which can refer to a crossing point or a cross in the Christian sense. Next to the tree line is a modern road, but lower down is a track which leads from Grice down to the abbey, just around the corner, a mile or so away. Here we see that Grice is no ordinary encroachment. Most encroachments were little more than squatters' hovels surrounded by a few small fields. Grice gives every appearance of having been built on a much more ambitious plan, involving planning and investment beyond the resources of an individual. At its centre, Grice has a drained platform on which once stood buildings. The track leading to it is clearly visible. But on closer examination, it appears that the section of the track closest to Grice is an offshoot of a track which once went to the next valley. Not in this image is a ridgeway at right angles to this track, a crossing.
Alongside Groys is a vegetation covered route which leads down towards Fishpool Farm, another site echoing Cistercian interests. A few hundred metres from Groys is this steep sided valley. The stream running through it is the only surface water on Kevin Terrace. It goes down to the fish pole of Fishpool Farm. Visible in this photograph are the relic are some relic field banks here, here, something on this side. These are more clearly seen from the air or even on Google and Bing satellite maps. Looking up this valley, the pattern of these banks becomes clear, together with some associated platforms. Taken together with Groys, these suggest a specialist sheep and possibly cattle enterprise on a significant scale, an organisation and management which possibly stemmed from Cistercian influence, if not control. And now for a lowland site. This is Manoti, a Cistercian grange near Knighton. Offers dyke, runs along the hills off the right of this image. I will be concentrating on the earthworks and field in the foreground. A vertical photograph shows a rectangular enclosure with some parch marks indicating the presence in the past of a house. A modern farm track cuts part of the bank and a stream flows alongside it to discharge in the river Lud. Photogrammetry shows a lot more detail. The enclosing rectangular bank starts to take on a more military defensive form within a pre-existing field system. The building is seen to have its own small adjacent enclosure. Within the outer field, there are hints of ridge and furrow ploughing. A linear line is a relic leak leading from the lad to a mill just off this image, while a wide track between banks was probably used to drive stock to upland pastures near Offers Dyke. I have coloured the higher ground in orange, down to green along the lad. This site is referred to as Minotti Moat. I wanted to emphasise that any water put into the surrounding ditch would simply have flowed out at the southern end. Exaggerating the heights in the digital model shows the form of this site more vividly. The possibility of the rectangular banks and ditches being defensive, enclosing a large interior, become more plausible. These earthworks are significantly different to any of the surrounding field boundaries. This is further supported by the double banked southern boundary. This interpretation is consistent with a local tradition in which Owen Glindara is reported to have spent the night before the Battle of Pilleth, 1402, at Manotti. It would have been easy the next day to have followed the drove route from the site to reach the high ground above Pilleth, the battle site, some two kilometres away, without being seen by the encamped English in the valley below. It is also possible that a few hundred brawny Welsh fighters to have dug 
very rapidly the rectangular defences around the Cistercian building. The scale of the defences would have allowed the Welsh to camp here with some security from any surprise attack by the English. While this is speculation, I put it forward as a plausible explanation for this unusual site. The form of the house has been extracted from parch marks. The house was pulled down after the dissolution and a new Tudor building, the Notty Hall, built a few miles away. This project has been very much a community project. While within the context of presenting at a CPAT organised meeting, I have concentrated on archaeological matters, I should finish by referring to some of the project's wider aspects. The Lanarkdirian excavation engaged a wide range of people of all ages. I should add that we are clearing another farmstead on the Cumforn farm, ready for further excavation. A dual language pamphlet has been published at schools. There have been local exhibitions. Expert-led field schools have been organised, covering such topics as botany, geophysics, geology, flint and bronze age tools, drone archaeology. A set of historical local walks has been published. Some 60 people have participated in our activities and gained fresh insight into the history of the area. Eight new records have so far been added to the HER database. Participants have learned to handle software such as QGIS and surveying equipment. We now have a team of volunteers with an understanding of the basic principles of archaeological excavation. Volunteers have been trained in the use of available historical resources. We have a dual language website with which to communicate our work. None of this would have been possible without the early encouragement of organisations such as CADU and CPAT and the ongoing professional support provided by the Sacred Landscapes project and of course our various funders. Central, however, has been the enthusiastic participation and driving force of our core team drawn from the Abicom Here Heritage Trust. I hope I have been able to give you a glimpse of the work already undertaken and a promise of more to come. We have only just started. More details can be found on our website, abicomhere.org. Thank you for your attention.